right, hello everybody, and welcome to Geopolitical Trends, where truth matters. I have an exciting, exciting show for you tonight because I have a great guest that you guys been asking me for over four months to get him on the show. And my answer to you was, he will be here in due time because the man is busy and you all know how it is. So, so the guest is here and I am going to bring him in, none other than Carl Za. Here he is. Hi, Carl. Hi, David. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, you are most welcome. And I couldn't wait for the conversation uh, to have this with you. I'm not going to waste any time because I want to pick your brain on a host of issues that uh, I believe as geopolitical analyst, I am very concerned as to where things are moving forward, given the rhetoric that is coming out of Washington vis-a-vis -vis China. And this is one of the first topic I would like to talk to you about is I'd like to get your assessments as to where do you see the U.S.-China relations in light of the U.S. growing military presence in the region going forward? Well, the U.S. militarization of the Western Pacific uh, around the Chinese coast, this is nothing new. This has happened since uh, World War II. I mean, since, mm -hmm. since especially since 1949, the founding of the People's Republic. And what we, I, I like to put it into a historical context because um, if you look at the Vietnam War era, during mm -hmm. that time, the entire South China Sea was actually American Lake. You know, you got the U.S. Air Force uh, base, in the Clark Air Base in the Philippines, the Supic Naval Base in the Philippines, and the U.S. have the Naval Base in, in South Vietnam. And it has base all over Vietnam. It has bases in, in neighboring Thailand, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. and it has the so-called Yankee Station and Dixie Station, which are these two aircraft carrier groups that were permanently stationed in the, air, uh, in the South China Sea. So allow the mm -hmm. U.S. aircraft to, to carry out bombing of Ho Chi Minh Trail and North Vietnam. So compared to 1970s, Right now, U.S. has actually been in retrenchment um, after the end of the Cold War. U.S. got kicked mm -hmm. out of, well, U.S. got kicked out of Vietnam. And then yeah. U.S. got kicked out of the Philippines but because the Philippine parliament voted to not extend the lease on the Clark Air, uh, Air Base and the Supic Naval Base. So what U mm -hmm. United States is trying to do right now, they're trying to sneak back into Asia you know, especially in the Philippines right now, they're under the guise of the China threat. They're trying to come back to the Philippines. So they're trying to reignite the Cold War 2.0. And yeah. but but U.S. is having its hands full at the moment, because as we all know, U.S. is carrying on a proxy war in Ukraine against Russia, which mm -hmm. I think U.S. had bite more than you could chew. And, and at the same time now with the Middle East conflict breaking out, uh, U.S. had to full-heartedly support Israeli atrocities in Gaza. And, and that led to the U.S. intervention in Yemen to try to break the Ansar Arab imposed blockade on, on the Red Sea yeah. traffic. So yeah. the U.S. is empire is overstretched. I mean, it, as much as it wants to pivot back to Asia to confront China, which is one of its top priority of the military industrial complex. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a case of the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The, the U.S. Weak. just doesn't, it's just spread too thin. And, and uh, mm -hmm. let's face it, right now, Israel demand all the attention because Israel has always been the U.S. golden boy. You know, you Ukraine and Thai... Ukraine and Taiwan, I'm sorry. You guys have to take a back seat, you know, take a number, go, go back in the line. Because yeah. everything is going to, to Israel right now. And and as we know, the US bombing campaign in Yemen has been very ineffective. That's not lifting the blockade yeah. on on the Red mm -hmm. Sea. I mean Answer Our Law is effectively a world naval power at the moment because they're the redirecting moment. eleven percent of the world traffic of the shipping traffic away from the Red Sea yeah. through Suez Canal to around the Cape of uh, Africa. Oh, except they're not attacking the Chinese and Russian shipping. 
Yeah. You know, like that's that, that's why all the ships are going through Red Sea now. They're putting on the cow side. Oh, it's <laughs> full Chinese crew, or we're going to True. deliver to a chi- China, or or this <laughs> China owned ship. So I mean, even like that that British ship that was attacked earlier, they're trying to falsely yeah. depict themselves as a chi- China owned uh, owned ship. Of course, who the, the answer are Allah had better intelligence. They knew it's not You're Chinese. Right. They know it's You're right. They hit it anyway. Yeah. So yeah. so and and that this is why you are seeing like Bloomberg articles about how China enjoys an unfair discount over their shipping insurance through Red Sea. I mean, like, duh, just like no, don't support yeah. genocide. Do not support Israeli atrocity in Gaza. That's that's yeah. the whole purpose yeah. of the Red Sea blockade. But yet U.S. cannot do that. Mm-hmm. Not only you, U.S. cannot do that, but right now U.S. cannot even get its own um, United States Defense Department mm-hmm. commission ships, probably carrying yeah. weapons and ammunition for Israel to go through the Red Sea. They just got turned back mm-hmm. by the Israel up missile broad. So... So yes, U.S. do want to confront China. U.S. do want to create tension uh, all, all along the periphery around China in the so-called first island chain. This is a area China, that's yeah. island chain that stretched from Japan down to Okinawa, uh, through the Philippines, mm-hmm. all through South China Sea. Mm-hmm. But yeah. now, you know, believe it. But go ahead, speaking sorry. of Philippines, well, sorry to interrupt here because before mm-hmm. I forget that. Speaking of Philippines, now if we are to say that the Philippines, because I remember uh, right after Marcos Jr. took over, his first trip was to where? To Beijing, right? And came back and signed a military agreement with the U.S. to expand about nine bases. I'm aware of four that they have not been disclosed. Okay. The question becomes is, is the Philippines playing both sides? And why? Why? So the, the, right now, I think Philippines is not playing both sides. Now they have, I think what happened is after hmm. Mark, Bang Bang Marco's trip to Beijing, you know, he uh-huh. immediately later, he went to Washington and Uncle Sam uh-huh. made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Offer. You know, like hmm. you, you should think of U.S. as a mafia. You, should, you think U.S. government as a mafia <laughs> everything makes sense everything makes sense you know this is they made him an offer he couldn't refuse and and right now they're basically spurring all the they're reversing the 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 policy of duterte's his predecessor mm-hmm. uh, during duterte mm-hmm. like now now you hear oh china posed a threat to the philippines in the south china sea now you like you that wasn't the case when duterte was president because duterte That's was true. was having a, a approach uh, having a reconciliatory rec- approach with China. He was with mostly China. against U.S. imperialism in mm-hmm. his own country. That's why U.S. didn't like mm-hmm. him. And, and, and that, and that time, mostly the China Philippines relationship was good. And China was pouring a lot of investment to, mm-hmm. uh, to build infrastructures, you know, to, to do Belt and Road, uh, uh, uh projects. But now with Marco, Bang Bang Marcos accepting Washington deal, they're now rolling back a lot of the Chinese investment in the country and to replace with what was United States bases, U.S. U.S. Marines coming back, U.S. Navy is coming back, U.S. US special forces are coming back. Um, well, I mean, you know, Philip, I know this, the Philippines, they, 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 they elect their own leaders. It's a democracy. It's a democracy. <laughs> so, so, you know, yeah. I, I think, um, you know, they, 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 they have to live with the, the 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 consequences of their actions. I mean, which just means less Chinese investment. Let's face it: United yeah. States is not going to be able to match China in terms of economic development in Southeast Asia. I mean, the the amount of U.S. the amount of U.S. dollars that U.S. invests in Southeast Asia economies is been dwarfed by the Chinese investment into South Southeast Asia. Where I am right now in Indonesia, we just had a we just com- uh, Indonesia just completed this first high speed rail uh, from Jakarta to Bandung, and it was built by, right. by the Chinese. And and it's I heard about at, it. Yeah, it's traveling at three hundred fifty mm-hmm. kilometer per hour, something that wow. U.S. will probably not see for a long time. <laughs> and 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 this is Indonesia. Indonesia is having a high speed rail, a legitimate high speed rail before United States. Right. I mean, this is what China can do for countries. Yet, 
um, the Philippines, they're, they're deciding to make their um, bet with the U.S. right now. You know, we'll, we'll see how that works out for them. But I, I'd like to remind people, Philippines, yeah. um, despite have not experiencing a war since World War II, the Philippines has not had a major war since World War II. Compare Philipp- economy of Philippines and Vietnam. Vietnam experienced a, a very, a very brutal uh, war, a, a war of liberation against the colonial power France and United States. And, and Vietnam was desperately poor in the 1975 uh, when, when the war right. ended. And, and, but compared to today, Vietnam and the Philippines, Vietnam per capita, uh, uh, GDP per capita is overtaking the Philippines. And it's, it's just the, the, the gap mm-hmm. is going to grow. And because, you, you know, Philippines right now, it's, its economy is uh, depending on exporting labor to the rest of the world. Vietnam, they actually have countries investing and building not uh, only infrastructure, but factories. A lot of the Chinese factories are now being outsourced yeah. to Vietnam. So this is a difference like, like, because Philippines, for, you know, it has been a U.S. colony for for uh, mm. for a long time. And, and even yeah, after right. it reached independence, Philippines was still largely a U.S. vassal state ruled by a very small clique of oligarchs who who do U.S. Sure. bettings. And, and, you know, you can see the result. I mean, like the, 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 the biggest contrast is just look at the Philippines and Vietnam. Vietnam has much more better prospect than Philippines, despite having just pulled itself out of a very brutal war. So, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. For those who might be just joining us right now, I'm having a conversation here with Carl Za, directly from Indonesia, where he's at. So, uh, to follow up on the point you mentioned about the presence of military, I have a picture here uh, that I'd like to share with our viewers. This one has to do with the location as to where the U.S. Special Forces are. Those are Green Beret, if I'm not mistaken. And this is a closer to the Chinese border. So the question that comes to mind is, what are we doing there and what for? Well, I mean, they're, well, they're, they're they're not there to stop the PL People's Liberation Army from landing because you know whatever like the field doesn't green beret is not gonna do shit. I sorry, I can't swear. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're not. They won't, right. be, they, won't the even, they won't even be able to do crap. But what they do serve yeah, yeah. is they're serving as the so-called tripwire. There's their so-called tripwire huh? forces by by placing have physical presence of U.S. personnel there. So if there, a conflict does break out and U.S. say, oh, our, our troops are in danger, support our troops. You know, they killed our troops wow. or they hold the troops hostage. That's a way for to bring United States into a full war. That is their purpose. And, you know, the other purpose is gathering intelligence. But, I mean, come on. I, I don't know what kind of intelligence they can gather. People can look up the 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 uh, Kinmen Island on Google and look at the view of Kinmen Island. It's it, like you can see the the shot the city of Shaman, which is one of the major Chinese seaports just across the waters, and and Kinmen is relatively undeveloped, uh, you know, in comparison. So I, I like to joke, you know, what are these green braids gonna do? They're gonna sit there stuck in this tiny island and look at the amazing Chinese cityscape just across the water, which they cannot go <laughs> because, because of their, their yeah. deployment, uh, their military deployment on the island. And, and, and you know, that, that, that's the only thing they're going to do. But, but, but the, it's designed to be provoc- provocative. U.S. is trying to lay a bait yeah. for China. You know, you see Anglo media. They always try to uh, pre- predict something disastrous was going to happen. Back in 2019, during Hong Kong protests, for example, every a lot of the pundits were saying, oh, it's going to be Tiananmen 2.0. The People's Liberation Army tank is going to roll down the street of Hong Kong. I mean, that's uh, anyone who knew what's going on in Hong Kong in China knew that's bullshit. Yeah. But a lot of people in the West genuinely believed it because they, they really want something bad to happen to China yeah, because they, they knew U.S. itself is facing a lot of trouble. And so as a sort of hopian and copian, they wish something equally bad could happen to China. They can at least feel better about themselves. Yeah. And I think this is a case yeah. where um, 
you know, a lot of the Anglo media were kind of very giddy, almost giddy about a potential war breaking out over Taiwan for the last several years. And they're talking about, oh, the election, Taiwan election might trigger a Chinese response, which is which is preposterous. And because China yeah. has time on its side, China, Chinese China's strength is still growing. You know, they talk about slowing China, China's economy and, and booming U.S. economy. But if you look at the numbers, U.S. economy. Uh, it's a lie. Yeah. U, U.S. Yeah, economy. In the U.S., our economy, our economy is not doing well. It's not doing well. Well, I mean, they, they, they look at the numbers. The U.S. is doing like 2.5% uh, percent annual growth. They were like, oh, my God, Biden is amazing. Right? He saved U.S. <laughs> He's putting on the U.S. on the back on the path of the growth. And the, the Chinese growth number is 5.3%. So they say, no, China, China, China is growing, slowing down. China is declining. China is going to collapse. You, you think about it. Wait, wait. Chi China's economy just grew twice as fast as the United States, yeah. and you are celebrating yeah. a great victory of 2.5 percent yeah. growth, whereas the China just literally just registered a growth that's double that of the United States economy. So, but there's a lot of copying and copying about China. I mean, this is what, what the newspaper, you know, they try to sell to their audience. Um, but, but U U.S. also want to increase attention. In the Taiwan Strait, in the Philippines, in the South China yeah. Sea, so they can right. justify to ship to deploy more U U.S. military assets all along the regions. I mean, it, the increasing tensions helps the military-industrial conflict. It, it, it helps U.S. to sell more weapons, sell more weapons to uh, Taiwan. A U.S. just yeah. uh, the Congress just approved what like a ninety-five billion dollar. Uh, uh, a, a budget to to supply Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. It's like okay, one hundred seventeen. Yes, one hundred seventeen, yes. Carl. I was and, shocked. And, Even and, for and that, it, part of it for Taiwan. What for? Exactly. Is there a conflict in Taiwan? Is there is a war in Taiwan right now? I mean, like, like okay, Israel. Uh, okay, we know U U.S. will support Israel no matter what. Okay, no matter Ukraine. What. There's actually a a, a a a conflict going on. Right now, there is no conflict in Taiwan. So what the hell are they doing? I mean, this is just a way yeah. to funnel money to the defense industries. Yeah. I mean, I mean, right now, U.S. has de-industrialized de so much. Only thing they can do is military Keynesianism. It's just to continually pile money to, to give it to the defense industries because that's the only thing U.S. is producing domestically yeah. at the moment just weapons uh, it's it's sad but that's it's, it's a state of affair yeah. let alone that if you think about it as a former military myself uh, we are not in a position to fight two front wars because we couldn't even win one uh, let alone fighting two and second question a second uh, part of it is that uh, china's of today is not of china's of 30 years ago things have changed drastically and this is why i don't understand even one who is here and i spend my time in dc and all that didn't get it why aren't they getting it that you cannot be creating tensions or fermenting more tensions with china and thinking things are gonna work out for you it won't well, I mean, I think there is a lot of U.S. conceit. There's, uh, you know, there's a lot mm -hmm. of hubris in Washington, especially with the end of the Cold War. And this is why yeah. when uh, after the Cold War, when Russia wanted to be, actually wanted to join the West, that you that they decide now we're going to expand NATO, use the opportunity to weaken Russia further to expand NATO mm -hmm. e eastwards, which led to the current Ukraine conflict. I mean, it's, it's the same mentality, but this it also extends to, uh, I mean, that, that same mentality extends to China. U U.S. is so used yeah. to being number one. Now it, it worries that it's, it's a number one status being challenged by China. So it's yeah. doing whatever. It, 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 it think everything is justified as long as keep U.S. in the top spot, which means they have to contain China, which is kind of fool's errand because um, you know, how do you do that? How, how, how do you contain China? China is well integrated into the world economy right now. I mean, if you look at the China is literally the world's factory. You, 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 you blockade China, you sanction China, you're sanctioning yourself. I mean, like, like the, 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 you don't have to even have to blockade the Chinese port. The, the, the Chinese uh, goods just don't have to leave to head 
to come to California, you know, and then then you're gonna have a yeah. have a major crisis go on on hand. But 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 a lot of the people in Washington, I think they are one, they're short sighted because they all care about is uh, fear mongering to get votes mm -hmm. and also to to please their financial donors, which is a lot of these uh, weapon manufacturers. So I mean, they're, they're not thinking long term, like five, ten years. You know, that's beyond anything beyond the election cycle is not something they they, they they actively think about this is a difference between china and the united states by the way because china they have five-year plans right they have multiple five-year plans they plan ahead for the future that's why they're able to build this amazing uh infrastructure yeah. all across the country in u.s everything is short term they look it's like uh because u.s is run by the wall street right so you know wall street type they just look at the that's quarterly true. Profits. They look at the the stock price, the, the quarterly report. So, so everything is geared to the short term. I mean, this is the fundamental difference between the two two yeah, systems. Yeah. yeah. Now, how come? How come? Uh, based on what you said, which makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, I, I I can second. I second that. How come countries in the region, the likes of Japan, the likes of South Korea, and I will even include two other. Uh, Australia and India. Why are they allowing themselves to be used? Because we are opening more logistical hubs in those countries. So how so, come they are trading with China, but at the same time they're allowing this? What's the rationale so, for that? Right, because you know, U.S. empire in East Asia is not sustainable with its overseas bases mm. in Japan, in Korea, in Australia. And this is this network of alliances, right? Because yeah. the U.S. faces tyranny of distances. He has to cross the entire Pacific Ocean to fight China. Yeah. So he, if he doesn't have the forward deployment bases in these countries, U.S. can't really can't do anything. But mm. in the case of Japan, uh, I think there's a little bit fear. There's a little bit mm -hmm. guilty conscience because. The Japanese politicians they still remember what their grandpa did in China in World War II. So right. Let's remember Shinzo Abe, the, 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 the former prime I minister remember. of Japan who got, got assassinated. His grandpa's nickname is a monster of Manchuria. His, his grandpa Nishi was one of the architects of China, Japanese colonial project in Manchuria. And, 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 and the, these politicians, you know, they have the... These dynasties, Japan, Japan is, you know, people say Japan is a democracy, whatever, but Japan has, it's been a sure. one party rules for most of the post-war period, right? And a, yeah. a lot of them are the holdovers from the old, old uh, political dynasty that stretch all the way to the World War II era. Uh, you know, Shinzo Abe is an example. And now like, uh, you know, his relative is still <laughs> still in the government. And and and, and the, the, these people, they, they fear a rise in China because they always fear that chi you know <laughs> China is gonna take revenge on what, what Japan did to them. So 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 even though they, they don't exactly like US for what US did to them, like new the Japanese nationalists still remember they got new points, yeah. but, yeah. but they are like, okay, at least. You know, maybe at least the U.S. can maybe can save us from a resurgent China. So that, uh, <laughs> that fear, it's that fear that's driving the Japan-U.S. security pact because they, they yeah. um, but uh, Korea is a little bit different. Well, South Korea, South Korea is also a, a Jap, a, 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 let, let's face it, both South Korea and, and Japan, they're, they're client states of the United States. They don't have two yeah. sovereignties. I mean, any Japanese prime minister who dare to say no to U U.S., they get replaced very quick. <laughs> they, they don't last long in the office. So that's one thing, you know, they still have militaries, uh, U.S. military bases on their soil. And, and two, you know, South Korea, they're, they're facing um, their, their issues with, with, with North Korea, with DPRK. And, yeah. and, and so they kind of depend on the United States to provide security. They, they feel like they need the U.S. protection. And, and because of that, they have to go with whatever uh, U.S. want them to do. You know, these, these politicians, when U.S. says jump, they say, well, how high? Uh, this is why the South Korean politicians allow U.S. to station the THAAD um, uh, anti-ballistic missile defense in 
South Korea. North I mean, Korea. Ost yes. ostensibly that, that missile system is supposed to deter North Korea, but everybody knew it was there to, to contain China. China. So because yes. if you place the missiles closer to China, you can shoot the Chinese missiles down, uh, fa uh, respond faster. And, and, and yeah. this is why China was very angry with South Korea when the when, when US did deploy the that system in South Korea. So so South yeah. Korea, they they are kind of got their hands tied because they you know they can't really say no to their master United States either. Um, now at the uh, but there's also economic anxiety in both Japan and South Korea too because even though they did a lot of business in China, their company continued to to get a lot of profit in China, but with the rise of the Chinese domestic industries are facing yeah. tough tough competitors now. You know, like like the, the South Korean car industry in particular, they they are losing their market share in in China so quick to the Chinese domestic uh, manufacturers. So, you know, no. same thing with Japan, and and so they, so it's it's a mix of fear, of fear uh, their own fear about the their own uh, loss of competitiveness against the Chinese economy and the, and the continued rise of China. And that prompt them to to cling on to the U.S. Security Alliance. Now, with um, the, the 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 Australia now Australia is an interesting case because China is Australia's <laughs> biggest export market, biggest export partner. You know, yeah. if you look at the Australian economy and China Chinese economy, they're actually complementary. China imports a lot of raw material. Yeah commodities from Australia. There's actually a, a show from a comedy show from Australia. Um, uh, I think like five, six years ago, they actually mm -hmm. pointed out this absurdity of the education. It's like they, they, they do like a, a cat. It, it, it's a satire, you know, like they have a, they yeah. have a, a security uh, meeting between the prime minister and his defense officials. So they were like, how can we justify an increase of $360 billion in defense budget? And he look around and nobody says anything. And they say, okay, how about, how about I say, I, I point out something, you say yes. So they're like, oh, not. Nah. Uh. He said, how about, how about for, we are defending our trade route. They're like, yes, defending our trade route. Okay, who is our largest trading partner? China and everybody <laughs> not. So like, so you are saying we need to spend three hundred sixty billion dollars to defend our trade route with China against China? Everybody's just like, yeah, not. Nah. Yeah. I mean, that is what Australia is facing right now. They are being dragged yeah. into this because that's funny. United States, because the United yeah. States, because their security alliance with the United States, they yeah. are literally going against their own national interests. But Interest. again. Australia is uh, unique in a way. It's Australia and New Zealand. They're like the two white settler colonies, right next to Asia. So there's always inherent fear of being taken over, of being swamped by like the yellow peril. I mean, I mean that's why Australia for the longest time they maintained a white Australia policy, which only accept mm. immigrants from white countries. Um, you know, this, that that was only repeal like you know a few decades ago. And so, so, but yeah. there's still fear of this, like Chinese or the Asians going to come over and take over Australia, take over. and that that yeah. plays perfectly into like the the the, the yeah. Five Eye Intelligence. Uh, mm -hmm. The Five Eyes Intelligence Agency is a cooperation between intelligence agency of the Anglo countries: United States, Australia, UK, New, New Zealand. Zealand. Canada, right? So the Anglo Five. So, so they they kind of stick together because Australia feels like okay, we have to stick together with the big brother, United States. Again, they they're the ones who got our our back during World War II. They're, they're, we yeah. rely on on U.S. for defense against the hordes of Asians to come in down to take us over. <laughs> and so, so this is a this is an Australia's predicament. Uh, mm -hmm. India is a little bit different because India is uh, it's it sees itself as a great power. I mean, India is ancient civilization. It's a, that's uh, true. As, as yeah. ancient as China, it sees itself as inherit inheritor of a great civilization. It's a great it sees itself as a great mm -hmm. power. Uh, but mm -hmm. India and China had this thing called the border dispute since 1950, since the founding of the People's Republic and 
and the founding of modern India. They had the border yeah. dispute, um, and and that that border border dispute was never uh, resolved. In fact, the the two fought a war in 1962 uh, for the border, and it's uh, it's really because uh, you know China at that time offered to make a compromise in 1959, and Zhou Enlai went to New Delhi and said, "Look, how oh. about let's just respect, let's just uh, you know." make the, the 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 current border that we each other control the international border we'll just finalize and make international border but india did not agree because that means trading uh conceding so so china's offer was okay we claim because we claim this part of your territory you claim this part of our territory let's just do the swap you know we trade our claims then we just finalize our border because you know Nobody, neither side want to give up the territory we, we already control, which we'll swap our claim. But India rejected yeah. that, that 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 proposal. So so two side went to war in 1962, and because that border issue, uh, there's also you know the the kind of uh, um, uh, a rise of Indian nationalism as well, because uh, the, they they all. Because India and China, they're two inheritor of two ancient civilizations. They're mm -hmm. both two of the world's most populous countries. So there's a little bit of rivalry going on when India saw that China kind of pull ahead after, Very uh, fast. you know, after, yeah, after, because I, I lived in China in 1980s. I remember at that time, the Chinese GDP per capita is about the same as India, maybe even yeah. a little bit lower. But yeah. after 2000, China just took off. Uh, I mean, like right now, uh, China's economy is like five times greater than that that of india it's a 17 17.3 17 trillion dollars gdp yeah. for china in comparison to 3.7 trillion dollars for india i looked oh, at so this it's more uh, than five times okay yeah. so this is more yeah, than yeah. five times it's almost six times um yeah. so so this is why you know uh, i think this is on, on part of the indian nationalists it feel like a little bit of rivalry but at the same time india is different from japan yeah from yeah. Korea, from, from Australia, because compared to two U.S. vassal states, of uh, India is not really a U.S. vassal state. U.S. is its own man. U.S., I mean, India is its own man. India, India yeah. is playing for the best interest of India. So what that means is right now they are at a position to cash in on the geopolitical rivalry between China and, and United States. The same way that China played the role between the competition between U.S. and USSR during the Cold War, because back then the both side also tried to compete mm -hmm. for China, mm -hmm. and the U.S. played the China card during the Nixon visit to Beijing. So this is what U.S. is trying to do vis-a-vis -vis India. They're trying to play the India card against China by um, by by welcoming India into the Quad. The, uh, from the Indian side, they can get access to more advanced U.S. military technology, U.S. investment. Uh, but at the same time, they're, they're, they still pursue an independent policy because India did not, it's still part of the BRICS. They, they did not sign on, on the sanction against Russia because India right. maintained a tie with Russia that dates from its legacy with India ties with Soviet Union. So India is kind of, India is truly playing both sides. They're, they're trying to get the best from the both sides because China also tried to offer uh, investment to India, trying to woo India on its on its side, uh, you know, away from the U.S. So 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 India can can sit on the fence and continually click duties from both sides. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. geopolitically, India is sitting in a in a, a golden position. Um, so th in this in this situation, India is very different from Japan. And South Korea, Japan, and South Korea really don't have much to say in this matter. Yeah. Whether they they sign on the anti-China bandwagon or not, that's decided for them in Washington. And and yeah. and Australia is a still a little bit different because they're sort of vassal state of United States, but really they're kind of more like the deputy of the U.S. Empire. They're like the deputy of U.S. Empire in the South Pacific because they mm. they they also derive a lot. All these Anglo countries they also derive a lot of benefit for being included in the U.S. empire system, you know, more so than, say, Korea and Japan. Yeah. <laughs> they, they have a little bit more ownership of the U.S. Yeah. empire system. Uh, 
um, because they're the Anglo brothers, whatever. So yeah. I, I, this is my my take on this uh, these countries. Well, right that's now. correct, sir. Yeah. That is correct. Yeah. Uh, except I have to uh, push back again, not push back rather, but just to extend the conversation regarding the investments that India is hoping to get from the US. Well, I am noticing that more international corporations are leaving India. So basically, we're giving them lip service. Otherwise, why are they leaving India? Like, for example, the, uh, uh, the iPhone, they are taking back their manufacture to China. Things didn't work out in India, and this is where when I read art, when I read articles from like New York uh, uh, New York Times and Washington Post and so forth, all of them saying what well, India is gonna rival China economically. Well, hold on a second, you know what are you saying? How can they rival China when their infrastructure, India that is, is not up to date for it to compete vis-a-vis -vis what China is doing? So, and this is why I'm thinking uh, India cannot be on both sides of the fence forever. Well, India is like the great brown hope for the Anglo sphere, right? Uh, because okay. like, okay. Hmm. I thank you, froze. Uh, we have some slight communication here, guys. Hopefully, Carl will come back. Let me take a look at the chat box quickly here. Uh, yes, indeed, it froze. Yeah, it's frozen. So, can you guys hear me? Okay, let me see here. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, here is. Carl is gone. It's just the communication. He might come back. So I'm going to stay here, of course. He's coming back. And uh, <laughs> one of you wrote that uh, it was Modi that froze him. <laughs> well, it won't be nice of uh, Prime Minister Modi to do so because uh, if we were to say a democratic country, then freedom of speech right so yeah just communication uh, because za is in bali remember it's it just the it might come back so i'm gonna stay with you here guys till it comes back to uh we're only halfway into the conversation so um and yeah just to go back to the point of where carl was talking about uh, those four countries uh south korea uh Japan, let me see he's tweeting me here let me check twitter quick here i mean x that's what they call it, and see what he's saying. Uh, yeah, he just sent me a message here. Uh, let him know. Okay. Yeah, he's coming back. He just restarting his computer. So, uh, so the idea that he mentioned, oh, TNT, I want to say thank you so much. Dr. Dave, thanks for having calls on. Of course, and I knew, guys, you've been asking for it. It was just a matter of time, and and here is Carl back. Here he is. It was just. Hi. I got too excited. I broke the internet. Uh, I have to restart uh, my modem. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so I think I was talking about India. Um, yeah, the, about the four know, countries and mainly India for that. Yeah. The the Economist has been had article I think was back in two thousand or two thousand oh three saying India is going to overtake China right I mean now twenty oh. years later we know we know that didn't happen and no. and even even Apple when they talk about moving the iPhone production to India they they their very overly ambitious plan was to move twenty five percent of the iPhone production to India by twenty fifty right now it looks like they're not even going to reach no. that goal because no. right now over ninety percent of the iPhone is still made in China so the one of the problem is as you mentioned it's the lack of infrastructure um, and, and 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 a lot of the business regulation environment in India is just not very friendly to our, uh, foreign investment this is why foreign investors go to China in the first place because Chinese philosophy is if you build it, they will come, right? Like China rolled out a lot of uh, prefer preferential tax uh, uh, ta tax uh, mm -hmm. uh, policies to lure foreign investors to come to China because China understand 
once you put your factories here, you know, you can't just pick it up and move <laughs> and leave. You know, it's not like a hot money. It's not like the yeah. stock market. You can take your money, yeah. money in and take it out. If you actually put a physical, you know, Tesla plant in Shanghai, when you leave, you cannot take the plan with you, right? And so, so China understood that. So they they did a lot of uh, tax incentives. Uh, mm -hmm. But on, on, on top of that, China built amazing infrastructure. To, to they built ports, they built power plants, they built um, you know what one of the some of the problem that when uh, um, when these multinational try to decouple from China and move to country to Vietnam, for example, yeah. uh, some of the problem that they face is like power shortages, right? Um, mm. Like, because it's, it's, a, it's a whole, the, the, the manufacturing is a whole process. And, and it's not simple as just moving factory there. You need, a, you need roads, you need railroads, you need ports so you can ship your goods out. You also need reliable power to sustain your factories. But Vietnam is, is it, I think it's going to be fine because China is actually helping Vietnam to upgrade its power infrastructure right now. But mm -hmm. uh, India is, is a case where they make a very, they have a very uh, protectionist um, trade policy to protect their, their domestic companies. So, so it's make very difficult for the for, foreign investors to come in to do business. This, this was a case when um, I, I was looking in to invest in the Korean uh, POSCO steelmaker when I heard uh, Warren Buffett invested in POSCO they back did, in yeah. 2000s. And, yeah. and so I followed that development for a while. So, so you know, POSCO discovering India, they have a lot of um, uh, a like a cheap, low quality iron ore. But the, the Korean steelmaker um, invented a process to refine high uh, quality steel from this low quality uh, iron ore. So they, mm -hmm. th they thought this was a marriage made in heaven. You know, they just move a, open a factory in India and they were just able to produce more steel. But they ran into a lot of problems. You know, they, they ran into a problem first with the land acquisition. And, and like, it, like six years later, they still couldn't build a plan because you know, th there's a land dispute. Something would not happen in China. In China, mm -hmm. When they want to build something, they will build a factory in six months, right? So this is a reason why a lot of foreign investors chose to build in China in the first place. Yeah. It's not, um, you know, here in the United States, because we are so deindustrialized, we think like manufacturing, oh, it's just a bunch of people making like shoes and toys for us. It doesn't yeah. matter who do it, you know, and we can, we can just send, send, Send the, send the jobs to, to, to elsewhere. But that's not how manufacturing works. I mean, this China was being very smart about it. For example, when they welcome Tesla to China, they're like, okay, you don't have to techno you don't have to do technology transfer. You can own your factory hundred percent. But what we do require you is use local build uh, from local components and, mm -hmm. and, and use local suppliers for, for your parts. So this made Tesla to help to develop a whole series of uh, supply chain mm -hmm. in China to supply its, uh, its Tesla factory. That also mm -hmm. helped a lot of the, uh, uh, like a, 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 it, it spurred a whole growth of, 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 um, of industry surrounding the electric vehicles. And now those, those suppliers for Tesla also supply to the Chinese electric vehicle mm -hmm. makers. Mm -hmm. that's, that's outgrowing Tesla at this point. So this is the, the China, China has been, had a very smart, industrial policy for the last yeah. 40 years um they, and they they uh you know it's because they have they built a whole ecosystem of supply chain inside china so, so this is why even if more less like the now the low margin labor mm -hmm. extensive stuff are moving mm -hmm. out of china to places like vietnam to indonesia bangladesh etc but the the high-end manufacturing still stay in china in fact china is now challenging germany in the role of in the uh, in the realm of high end uh, 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 machine manufacturing, that used to be like the Germ Germany's uh, exclusive domain. So, so India still have a lot of catch up to do, yeah. but there's a lot yeah. of hopians and copians in the Anglo media. Like most of these, um, let's face it, most of these this journalists, so called journalists from the West, they they they, they, they they're not specialists. They don't they have very little. Uh, knowledge in, 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 in this in specific of manufacturing. Well, 
because manufacturing is gone from the United States. <laughs> they wouldn't have any first sure. hand, <laughs> hand uh, manufacturing. And and so so they they're not reporting based on the facts. So, so that's what I'm saying. And and most of the time, a lot of the financial reporting, especially on China, they're geared toward foreign investors. They're geared toward the foreign mm-hmm. investor, particularly those foreign investors who invest in the speculate in like stock market. Right. Yeah. And we all know stock market is is not exactly reflection of the real economy. The, no. the, the two can, can be quite decoupled. So this is why when you hear a lot of gloom and doom about Chinese economy, what, what's really happened, what's really saying is foreign investors right now are losing money in the Chinese stock market. <laughs> that, that's what those, what's really been reflected in, in, in uh, stuff like Bloomberg, Wall Street Journals and Financial yeah. Times. Well, I I don't invest in stock market, Carl. I made it clear from the '90s to never put my money in stock market. So, let me tackle one another point here. Why are you talking about the economy here? Because very very important. And I've been arguing, and I'm in the process of writing a book about China. Of course, the economy is going to be a major uh, section of the book and so forth. And I'll just uh, uh, get your take about where do we see the chip industry moving forward given how we decided to sanction china regarding chips and it ended up backfiring on us where this is the u.s sanction on semiconductors on china is the best thing that ever happened to the chinese domestic uh, semiconductor semiconductor manufacturer because before before chinese company actually want you know, they actually like to leverage the global supply chain, right? Like mm-hmm. before, um, you know, Huawei, for example, they mm-hmm. will always use top of the line product, top of the line supplier. A lot of the time that means a U.S. product. You know, this is why they would use buy chips from Qualcomm uh, mm-hmm. or, or have their own chip design, but by uh, manufacture in TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductors, oh, because yeah. that's where most of the advanced chips are manufacturing. Uh, rather than go through the Chinese local domestic uh, chip supplier, because the the local domestic um, semiconductor sector is couple couple generations behind. So for for big comp- global company like Huawei, it's like why do I need to go with second class product when, when I can source the first uh, class product that's reliable and and more economic. And mm-hmm. and so so this is a this is this way the Chinese mm-hmm. semiconductor. Uh, industry have has has trouble to catch up for decades because they it's hard to compete with the established brands right yeah, but course. now when us now says okay qualcomm you cannot sell chips to huawei and huawei's like okay fine we'll, 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 we'll design our chipping house and we'll have them manufacturing in taiwan and the us tells taiwan so like no taiwan semiconductor chips you cannot sell to china to mainland china and now, now Huawei has no choice. <laughs> they can't. They can't source other opponents other than the Chinese domestic manufacturers. So now they have to go to SMIC, the the Chinese domestic Chinese. semiconductor manufacturer, and say, "Okay, we'll we'll we'll, we'll give you a lot of money. <laughs> so you so to help to invest in you, so you can upgrade your production line to produce advanced chip for us." And that strategy worked. And this this forced all yeah. the Chinese tech companies to work together. Before they they're not, you know, because it's a global marketplace. They 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 yeah. rather to work with global partners than than the domestic ones. If the domestic ones didn't produce products mm-hmm. that's up to mm-hmm. par. But now the Chinese companies have no choice. It's do or die. They they do or die together. And and right. that's forced the synergy. Now, I mean, this the US semiconductor ban on China is 100 times more effective than Chinese government's own initiative to promote the domestic <laughs> semiconductor manufacturing. Because, uh, you know, it's this is just because now it, it made an existential issue for the Chinese high tech companies, mm-hmm. even the companies that still uh, didn't face the same restriction as Huawei at the moment. They, they see what happened to Huawei. They say, well, we could be next. <laughs> you know, we better have, we better, you know, have developed our self-reliance 
to, to yeah. work together with our Chinese partners than continue to rely on this very unreliable mm -hmm. U.S. supplier supply chain, right? So, so this is why, um, and, and let's face it, you know, like U.S., China produce engineers in, in, in like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands every year. They, you know, they don't lack talent. Um, they what what they what they need is a proper incentive. Uh, uh, you know, today technology um, it's 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 you know today's technology you just pile a lot of talent, you pile a lot of money, you, you mm -hmm. give it the right incentive, give it time. You know things will happen, and and this is what's happening in China right now. Like they they are making a lot of progress because they have to. <laughs> they realize to in order to survive they have to. Uh, they're forced to innovate by the U.S. sanctions. So I think that was the best thing that ever happened to the Chinese uh, tech space. Um, and and this this will seriously threaten Chinese uh, U.S. tech dominance down the road. I mean, I mean, five, ten years from now, if China no longer had to rely on the core U.S. tech, what 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 U.S. Um, you know what 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 what's going to be left for the U.S. like that's tech, true. Tech, tech dominance is one of the pillars. I was considered one of the three pillars of the three of American empire. You know, yeah. it's, it's a fi the financial dominance, dominance tech, yeah. tech dominance, and military. Right. Military. Those are the three. I call those three pillars of U.S. empire. Right now, uh, we're seeing all three on very wobbly legs. Right. You know, financial because U.S.'s own sanction against Russia is triggering the. The, the rush toward the dollarization all over the world. Yeah. Tech, because the U.S. sanction is forcing China, China. To, <laughs> to, to develop its own domestic it's industry. True. Well, military, look, U.S. has, people say, okay, uh, people will sh put the video of like all the U.S. aircraft carrier and, and, and U.S. plane flying on the sky. So this is what's back in the U.S. dollar. Well, guess what? All that is also backed by the U.S. dollar, so it's a chicken and egg thing. When the dollar goes, all that will go too. And, and that we already seen the problem in Ukraine. U.S. spend a trillion dollar in defense budget. What does that give to United States? They couldn't even supply artillery shell to Ukraine. You know, you, Russia alone is outproducing NATO countries in in the artillery shell production. Sure. You know, because this is. Fundamental issue is because U.S. have to, and 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 to extend a lot large part of Europe has been deindustrialized. Yeah. They their their economy is highly financialized, which means you know oh one trillion dollars sounds a lot of money, but when you know when to produce one missile or or one F thirty five, you 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 need like hundreds of billions of dollars. <laughs> At the end, you know, it's just a number. The dollar just become a number. It's it's meaningless. You are you are it. The, the amount of dollar does not match. Does not uh, is not matched by a real industrial production. I mean, That's people can see that by I. I remember somebody posted a chart of of uh, manufacturing, like why China is an industrial in, uh, industrial giant. You, you measure the China's industrial output versus industrial output from United States and Europe and Japan. So, so China industrial output right now is more than US, Europe, and Japan, South Korea combined. So wow. that is that is a difference. That's a, that's a, that's why that's why there's a lot of anxiety in Washington about China because they, they realize okay the continual rise of China means the end of US uh, US hegemony. Yeah. Well, that's why we end up shooting ourselves in the foot with these sanctions. The moment I heard about it back then, and I was like, what the heck are they doing? They don't realize that this is going to push China. It's exactly what happened with the ISS, the International Space Station. When the bill was passed in 2014, banning any Chinese astronauts from accessing ISS, the Chinese said, fine, we will build our own. We were thinking that the Chinese were just bluffing till they end up building their own. And it's the same thing I'm seeing with this uh, chip industry. Now, correct me, Carl, if I'm wrong here. This China was able already to build the four nano technology for the chips? I saw some reports, but I'm not, yeah. uh, I'm not so sure about I'm that. Because so I'm, sure also, 
I also heard that some of its uh, stockpiles from um, yeah, uh, you know what they bought before the sanction took place. Uh, you oh, know, okay. They, so some of them. I mean, China has a capability to design yeah. uh, five, four nanometer chip, but but traditionally they send their design to Taiwan to have the Taiwan semiconductor uh, yeah. to to manufacture it. So I heard. I what I heard was. Some of them may be one of those uh, previous batches stockpiled uh, from before. So, uh, but but I mean, I, it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. I, I I if they didn't come out with it this year, they will have it in the next few years. I mean, yeah. this is not this is this this is given. China has the resources. China has a talent. China yeah. has shit tons of money. China has an incentive to sure. to accomplish sure. its aim. So I I I mean it's just I mean, we're just talking about whether this is gonna happen in next yeah. two years or next five years. Yeah. Uh, but it's gonna happen. Yeah. Well, I intend to follow up on it when I visit your area. I'm gonna be in your area at some point in uh, uh, probably around May or so, and I intend to uh, check on this particular topic here. Now, let me turn over to, there are two other topics I'd like to get your take on them. One of them is Indonesia presidential elections. Where do we see, where do you see this is moving forward, given now when you consider Indonesia's role in the economy within Asia and how the U.S. is trying to leverage whatever with Indonesia? Where do you, what, what do you see? Well, so not many people talk about Indonesia, right? Uh -huh. Even though Indonesia is the fourth most populous country in the world, right? The, the top two is China, India. Number three is United States. And number four is Indonesia. Not, a lot of people don't even realize that. A lot of people don't realize how big Indonesia is. If you superimpose a map of Indonesia onto Europe, in the, that the Indonesia will stretch from the city of London all the way to the border of Afghanistan. That's how big oh Indonesia my is. Wow. Yes. And, and be, because of the Mekador projection, which makes the northern part of the, <laughs> the globe yeah. super big, you know, it makes a, Greenland looks like a continent. So because uh -huh. Indonesia is on the equator, so it looks small, but small. you can actually, yeah. you know, like it's the big. two sides of India is, uh, Indonesia is actually quite, quite large. Um, so Indonesia is uh, is right now. I don't foresee too much change because for mm. for for almost a decade, Indonesia was under a very popular president Jokowi, mm -hmm. and and but because the limit uh, a li the constitutional limit of two terms, Jokowi cannot run for another president third term yeah. so instead what he did is he made a deal with uh, defense minister Prabowo and so that Prabowo is having a running mate vice president who is the son of current president Jokowi so yeah. so this is way of Jokowi trying to ensure his political legacy you know by by having this political dynasty um and so, so I in the short term, I don't expect the policy to change dramatically from, um, from from the current from the current policy from the current Jokowi What's going on? policy. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, you know, I, I saw some reports say U.S. want to do uh, regime change or or color revolution in Indonesia. I don't put too much stock in that because. U.S. don't need to do color revolution. U.S. can just buy Indonesian politicians. I mean, this is Indonesia. Yeah. Yeah. U.S. can just buy the politicians like they bought uh, Bomb Bomb Marcos, right, in, in the Philippines. And yeah. and so, uh, but having said that, Indonesia is a lot more, um, have a lot more Chinese investment. You know, mm. it, it's a lot more integrated with the chi Chinese economy. Um, like right now, I'm talking to you on the 4G network that's built by Huawei. You know, Huawei built the 4G network in Indonesia. Um, the, the electricity is supplied by the Chinese built power plant on Bali, right? Wow. So, and, and like, like everybody in Indonesia, most people can now afford a smartphone is because the Chinese smartphone <laughs> made it affordable 
for everyone, even in countries like Indonesia, to own everyone to have a smartphone. My my our nanny has a smartphone, right? Uh, she has a vivo. Um, Interesting. Or either Vivo or Oppo, which is a Chinese brand, and yeah. and so, so, so Prabowo, the new president, he understands that. Um, you know, he understands that 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 economic destiny of Southeast Asia right now is tied with China because the gravitational pull of the Chinese economy, and yeah. China actually is making also a top, Southeast Asia one of its top priority for its Belt and Road project. Right, China is investing a lot of the, um, you know, everything from infrastructure to, you know, I already mentioned power plants oh, and, 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 and a high speed railroad and 4G network communication. Um, so, so chi and even Chinese gaming companies, right? There are a lot of uh, my my wife. She plays mobile games that's made by Chinese developers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like, um, you know, I I I think. I don't think United States has anything to match in terms of offering investment into Indonesia to replace the Chinese investment. Yeah. Uh, what United States will do probably, they will just um, try to offer to develop the defense ties. Because right now, only thing US can offer is military. Right? No, they, 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 they can't offer it. They can't compete with China economically, but they may offer to sell uh, uh, Indonesia some like F-18 uh you know some f-15 some, actually some actually car they agreed to sell the f-15s but not the f-18s right I, they are yeah. yeah they already agreed to sell f-15s but i mean they could still dangle out like f-18s or, or yeah. whatever like they want like the carriage right yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that, so. yeah they that's what they do so i mean yeah. like i i know a lot of people are very excited they're gonna get u.s planes but okay, well, sure. You know, it's this this is because uh, fundamentally, U.S. foreign policy yeah. at this point is driven by Pentagon and the the weapon manufacturers. So yeah. it's, it's their interest to to continually to sell weapons to Indonesia. And U.S. military does have a close tie with the Indonesian military ever mm -hmm. since the Cold War, right? The, yeah. the, the Indonesian army officers were trained in the United States, uh, and this is how. CIA were able to help the coup in the 1960s to 60, yeah. to you know to to in Indonesia. So so now um now now in the, Indonesia is a what uh, is it's for currently under Jokowi Indonesia's foreign policy is very friendly toward China. Um and I don't expect it like a, like a 180 degree change like Bongbong mm -hmm. bon Marcos. Just because Philippines is a bit special case, because Philippines has a, it was a U.S. colony for so long. It has, you know, it's it yeah. it it's hasn't pulled itself away from the U.S. orbit yet. But Indonesia is more uh, independent state, more like India, right? They Indonesia yeah. will ultimately um, try watch out for Indonesia's own best interest, um, and so so I think. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't foresee. Um, first of all, the the, 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 the election Prabowo won overwhelmingly means there's probably going to be a smooth transfer of power, yeah. and I don't expect the policy to change drastically in the short term. In the mid, medium term, long term, who knows? Um, you know, we'll, we'll see. But I mean, right now, U.S. is most of U.S. attention is still tied to Middle East. Right yeah. to, to this golden boy That's Israel, better. whether U.S. like it or not, it's you know yeah. it's it's tension is going there. It's gonna so there. it's gonna yeah. take it's gonna take a while for U.S. to 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 put its mind back on pivot to Asia. We'll we'll see how that works out. Yeah. It might be too late for us. So, uh, hey guys, before I forget, uh, just prepare a question or two for Carl for later on. We have to tackle one more topic before I'll open it for a few questions because I don't want to hold the car forever here uh before that i want to say thank you to uh taro man harris thank you very much for your super sticker truly truly appreciate it uh, jennifer lee one of the avid supporter of the of the channel thank you so much jennifer truly appreciate it so and as i said guys just prepare your question and put q so i know it's a question uh just i'll take one or two for carl later on the last thing i want to 
address with you, Carl. And I have my own question, by the way, Carl, regarding Indonesia. Why aren't we seeing Indonesia part of BRICS? Indonesia has a lot to offer. Why aren't they in BRICS? I, yeah, I mean, you would actually make sense for Indonesia to be in BRICS. Um, but I, like I said, U.S. still has a bit of influence in oh. Indonesia, still, especially through its tie with the military. Um, oh, okay. and, and, and Prabowo, the, the, the one that yeah. which just won election, he's a defense minister. He actually has a very close tie with the U.S., uh, with the Pentagon, mm. etc. So, so we'll, we'll, again, as we'll, we're going to have to see how. I mean, but even if Indonesia do not officially join BRICS, mm -hmm. but the fact on the ground, uh, you know, like I listed, there's already a lot of Chinese investment in the country, and and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Interesting. Interesting. Well, the last topic I want to address with you, because I can't let you go, Carl, without addressing this, has to do with Taiwan. Now, of course, that's the issue that is really turning the machine here in Washington. And as I said, I still have my contacts in D.C. We talk and all that stuff. My, always con my concern has always been about why the politicians are fermenting more tensions through Taiwan. Where this is gonna, will it ever end? We all know Taiwan is part of is, is, is part of China. Why aren't we play, Why are we playing this double standard of one China policy, but we go behind the scenes and provide weapons and aid and so forth? Well, like I said, U.S. policy currently is driven by Pentagon and the weapon manufacturers and mm -hmm. and manufacturing tensions in Taiwan Strait and South China Sea helps us to continue to sell weapons mostly expensive and outdated weapons to taiwan taiwan is one of the best customer for for wow. the us weapon manufacturers and and uh, the, the thing is you know also taiwan is a cornerstone for mm -hmm. the us containment stretch strategy against china i mentioned that geopolitically there's a uh, one island chain um because the idea is if if United States, if mainland China reunify with Taiwan, then the People's Liberation Army Navy can freely enter Pacific, which United States considers American lake, right? So it does, you want to contain the Chinese Navy and the power projection within the first island chain, which is the island chain that runs from, from Japan through Okinawa Japan, yeah. down through yeah. Taiwan, through Philippines, through South China Sea. And and, and so, so and, and, like, and like MacArthur famously said, Taiwan is unsinkable aircraft carrier, right? And it's, well, of course, it's an unsinkable aircraft carrier for United States in case something happens. Um, mm. So, we, 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 right, I mean, during the Cold War, people probably don't know this, but during the Cold War, United States actually stationed nuclear-tip Nike missiles on Taiwan, pointing at mainland China. And, and they actually had a plan to use them in the 1958 Second mm. Taiwan Strait Crisis. Uh, Pentagon actually had a plan to nuke China if the PLA made a landing on the Kinmen Island and, and, and take, take over Kinmen Island in 1958. This was revealed by the Daniel Ellsberg's leak. Oh, um, yeah, the leak, the Pentagon leak yeah. documents. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, a few years before he yeah. died, he passed away. He, 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 he revealed that. There was a, a plan in 1958 to nuke uh, mainland China if uh, if the, ki the the Taiwan crisis developed to the point that PLA overwhelms and takes Kinmen Island, and wow. and all that nukes were only withdrew after Nixon visit to China. So so Thai before U.S. actually wrote during the Vietnam War, U.S. actually rotated 60,000 troops through Taiwan, mm -hmm. and 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 after Nixon visit China, one of the term they agreed, you know, under the one China principle is that U.S. will pull out all its military from Taiwan. But of course, that that has been reversed under first under Donald Trump, uh, mm -hmm. when Donald Trump uh, decided to station Marines in the so-called uh, the, 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 the so-called de facto embassy uh, uh, on Taipei, because, because yeah. the, Trump claimed it's a diplomatic compound, so he needs Marine uh, protection, even though 
Taiwan is not officially recognized. And then now we continue under Biden. You know, now we know Green Berets have been sent to Kimmen Island. Um, this is all acts of provocation. Um, but China is not taking the bait. China has handling this very rationally. Uh, but we, but China will respond in terms of they will increase patrols around Taiwan Island. There, there will be increasingly more flyover by the by the Chinese Air Force, uh, more naval patrol around the Taiwan Island, and 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 uh, which is assertion of sovereignty. And then you know. Uh, there's not not much United U.S. can do about it. Uh, I don't think there's an imminent war to break out over Taiwan Strait because, like I said, time is on China's side. China is growing stronger and stronger year by year. You know, Ch China in 2030 will be much stronger than China today, right? They keep on saying, "Oh, China is going to invade Taiwan in 2027." It's like, why 2027? That's just an arbitrary number. You know, China in 2030 will be even stronger uh, than United. The gap between China and United States will just going to grow more and more. Um, and, and a lot of people don't realize this because they, they look at the U.S. economy in the, in the nominal dollar GDP terms. But yeah. in, in the actual industrial output, the, the, the power balance between China and U.S., uh, you know, because U.S. Pentagon planners all keep on thinking about fighting China like it's going to be a replay of Pacific War 2.0, right? They think, oh, you know, we, we know how this played out. You know, we did island hopping, you know, we, yeah. we, we move all the way to Japan. But what they don't realize is today the power balance, the industrial out power between China and United States is like that of 1941 between Japan and United and States, US. except... Except with the role reverse. Except now, <laughs> China is in the position of U.S. in 1941, and U.S. is in position, in position of, Japan of Japan in 1941. You're right. So, You're right. so I mean, it's it's kind of crazy to think that they, they, they can even even win a conventional war against China at this point. So, uh, but, but but you know that that will remain most uh, people's fantasy because China is not looking to start a war in Taiwan, right? Yeah. Unless U.S. want to push, really push the button. You know, we, we all know what that button is, is mm -hmm. right, Ty Taiwan declare formal independence, independence, which Taiwan will never do unless they have explicit approval, support, encouragement from Washington. But uh, hopefully the Washington elite are not, uh, have enough sense of self-preservation uh, to press a new Let's go. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Let's yeah, help. Let's I, help. Yeah. Well, great. So, so great of you, Carl. Uh, I'm going to take one or two questions for Carl here. And before I'll do this, uh, on behalf of all of you guys, we say thanks to Carl. Thank you so much, Carl, for really carving Thank out you. time for me here and for all of us to learn uh, a different perspective. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you. So here's the Thank first you. question from Dougie5. Uh, this is for you, Carl. What do you think Singapore will do if war breaks out in Taiwan, given that Singapore has military bases in Taiwan? Well, I mean, so what, what is Singapore going to do? Singapore is just, you know, Singapore is a, is a military, is a U.S. military base, right? I mean, like, yeah. it's, it's, you know, Singapore actually do not want a war to break out over Taiwan. Like most of the Southeast Asian states, they just want to continually trade with China. They don't want to be forced to choose a side. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, U.S. is pushing them to pick a, pick a side. You're either with us or against okay. us, right? But but most of the countries in the neighborhood, they just want to continue to trade with China and make money. And, and uh, you know, if a war breaks out, I don't think a war will break out, but if the War break on I me. Mean, what what can Singapore do? Singapore can can they say no to United States? I doubt it. You know, U.S. will just use Singapore as a, as a, its military base. U.S. will use Singapore to block the Malacca Strait, the very strategic Malacca Strait, where most of the China's mm -hmm. energy is coming from from Middle East. Um, but you know what? If if a war break out Taiwan, Taiwan, you know, it's 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 end of the human civilization is i i don't think there's any way i cannot think of any way it's not going to turn nuclear 
right? I mean, it's not going to end up in nuclear exchange, especially, you know, <clears throat> if a if a aircraft carrier gets sunk, if a U.S. aircraft carrier gets sunk in in South China Sea over Taiwan, I I I think, uh, yeah, I I can't, you know, U.S. planner has talked about it, you know, they will. Yeah can use tactical nuclear weapons. You know, once you go go nuclear, there's no turning back. It's going to be Armageddon. So good luck, guys. <laughs> you, you know, if it's going to, I, I don't see, I, I don't see any way other than ending in, in a nuclear winter if a war breaks out over Taiwan. That's, yeah. that's just my take. And that's why I don't foresee, I don't foresee that will ever yeah, happen. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see that. Yeah. Let me say thank you to Curious A. Thank you very much, Dr. Oprah. Obo signaled that he is willing to join BRICS. So that means Indonesia is willing to join BRICS. That would be that would be great. That would be great. So, all right. Let me see one more question. Final one for Carl before I let you guys go, and we we'll let Carl also get on with his whatever he needs to do. So. I'll let you know, by the way, Carl, I'm going to be probably in your neighborhood. Uh, not sure yet. I will, I'll give you a heads up. I'll give you a heads up. Here is a last yeah, question sure. here. The last question for, uh, 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 they want to know your take on Chinese and U.S. interest in Asia Pacific as a whole, particularly the Pacific region. For instance, U.S. security pact with PNG, Papua, Papua New Guinea, how this is going to yeah. shape the Secure the architecture. Most likely, that's uh, what the person wants to know. Yeah, this is part of uh, United States uh, trying to shore up what's this so-called the second island chain. So the first island chain runs from Japan down to Okinawa, Taiwan, uh -huh. Philippines. The second island chain goes from like Northern Marianas all the uh -huh. way down to Guam, uh, Palau, and all the way down to. Papua New Guinea, right? And, and U.S. is freaking out about some U.S.-China uh, China security agreement with uh, Solomon Islands, right? Solomon yeah. Islands, which is to the east of uh, Papua New Guinea. You know, some of the yeah. worst, uh, you know, people, uh, uh, what is that? Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal. There's a famous yeah. battle of uh, Pacific War that people may remember. That, that, so, 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 so when China had... Uh, Yeah. Oh, Carl froze. Oh, yeah. I'll take this, by the way, to say thank you to Alan Seen for the super sticker. Truly appreciate it. No. Let's hope Carl come back quick because I want to say bye to him before. Uh, but connection sometimes. Uh, these things happen, guys. You all know. Uh, nothing uh, surprising about it, but we'll see. Let's see if he comes back. No. Hopefully he will come back. <laughs> uh, and by the way, I'm gonna I put the uh, some info about Carl for those who do not know who Carl is. I put it in the description. If you guys can uh, log in there, uh, description of the video, and I'm gonna put the link for uh, his YouTube channel uh, for you guys in the description right here. You can check him out on uh, on YouTube. I I watch some of his videos there, so if you can you can check him out there, uh, it would be very interesting. So let's see if he comes back here. Otherwise, uh, I'm gonna just have to sign off here, and I will communicate with him at a later date, uh, just because the how the communication is at that time. Anyway, guys, well, uh, yeah, it's unlikely he's coming back here. So, mm, yeah, he's not here. So anyway, I do hope, uh, oh, let me say thank you here to uh, uh, Freedom Fox One. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, Carl is not here because he froze. So he's he, he dropped in the communication here. What does China do if the U.S. cuts off its food and energy imports? I'll be happy to answer that one for you. China will retaliate. And how China will retaliate? By also shutting down any import or export rather to the U.S., which we will suffer right here. We have the problem right now with the chips, and uh, it will be even worse because everything we have in the United States comes from China, especially when it comes down to food and so forth. So 
So that will be very, very problematic uh, for us. And the U.S. will not do that. So I don't see them doing that one. So uh, K, uh, Kim Cho, thank you so much, man, for your super sticker. Truly appreciate it. I appreciate you for doing that. It means a lot. So, uh, let me see who else. And uh, who I see. Uh, I do see someone here typed in uh, Chan Fu. If I need to get a hold of Chan Fu. Yes, I'm aware of him, and I'll be happy to reach out and extend uh, an invitation on the show here if he will be willing to come over. So, uh, okay, guys. Well, I think Carl is gone, so he won't be able to reconnect here. Uh, oh, he's here. No worries. No worries. Uh, tell him I'm going to wait. Yeah, he's coming back. He's coming back, guys. So, because I want at least to, for the proper way to say uh, uh, bye and, and all that on behalf of all of you. So, so we'll wait for him here and he'll show up. Uh, yeah, there are some that uh, individuals you suggested, guys. And I am reaching out to some. I will have another guest next week. I uh, have not confirmed the date yet and I will let you know. Uh, so once that happens and, uh, and we'll just go from there. Yeah, here is Carl. Okay. Yeah, sorry for this one here. By the way, Carl, uh, where, where can... Uh, there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Where can my viewers... Uh, where, where can they find you? you want um, I, have a, I have my own YouTube channel, just Carl Zha. Um, and I'm a pro, also a prolific ship poster on Twitter. Uh, my handle is just Carl Zha. Uh, no space and uh, also I, on patreon i host my silk and steel podcast on patreon so if you go to patreon.com search silk the first result should be my podcast the silk yeah. and steel podcast where i talk about everything about china and with a most main focus on history and i'm doing a chronological retelling of the chinese history from the beginning from the prehistory to the present wow. uh, now i'm around 540 BC. <laughs> so a long way to go. It's always nice to know. Yeah, this is the link, guys, for uh, Carl. This is his YouTube channel right there at the bottom. Uh, it's, uh, it's just youtube.com at Carza. He's also on Twitter, okay, because I am following him on Twitter. If you can check him out also on Twitter, follow him over there. Uh, subscribe to his channel, of course. And now that I've found that even for the history part, I'm going to have to log in and listen to what you have to say, uh, Carl, for all this. So uh, I'll take this opportunity to say thank you to Tamputra. Tamputra is one of our avid supporters, Carl, and he's saying thank you for inviting Carl Zao. Of course, it's, it's an honor and privilege to have Carl here on, on the channel to have a conversation. Well, Carl, I can't thank you enough, man. I truly appreciate it. And I look forward to having uh, another conversation with you, Hope. This is not your last time here. We'll reach out and we'll uh, we'll extend the conversation even further. So, thank you so much, Carl. Truly appreciate you. Thank you, David. Always my a pleasure. pleasure. You, inviting me back anytime. I love to talk. I certainly <laughs> will. I will do that, Carl. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye, bye bye. Bye bye. All right, guys. Well, I hope you find it very informative here, and I will invite Carl again, especially now that he's doing this series on history. I need to learn more about the Chinese history, given what I'm writing about China. I'm going to be in that part of the world. If I end up in Bali, I will reach out to him. And most likely I might do a live stream from there with Carl. Why not? We'll, we'll see how it goes. So, well, I hope you guys enjoy this. And I look forward to seeing you next time. As always, remember, geopolitics impacts your daily life in more ways than one. Till next time, guys. Bye-bye.